Yeah, hi everybody, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. We are talking on the subject of easily fooled. And how, may I ask, how easily fooled are you? Let's go on now. What I would describe in 1 Samuel 25 as possibly the most, what would I say, troublesome verses that I've ever come across. Because it's about a death of a man who left so many unresolved issues behind him and so much chaos behind him because of fear and because of um, dysfunction that, my goodness me, I'll tell you why I think it really is. I think it was because Eli wasn't a proper father figure for Samuel because Samuel was put into the temple at a very young age one of my followers said that he possibly may have been seven or eight. And I do, I do thank you for your comments, uh, Jen. And, um, but Samuel's passed away and he has left so many things unresolved. Can I say he never announced to the people that uh, Saul had been sacked as the king or dis the, the anointing taken off him back in 16, 17 chapters. And he never announced to the people that David had been anointed as the king. And this left the whole community, the whole social structure, the whole governmental structure in a complete confused state. Let's go, shall we? Then Samuel died. 1 Samuel 25 verse 1. And he died. I just got to stop here for a minute. He left so many things unresolved, Samuel. And this is a massive part of the problem. It's cost Saul and Saul and his sons their lives. They had people running around apparently for 20 years while Samuel, uh, Saul wasn't even anointed. But we miss all this, don't we? We've got David saying to Saul down in the caves, that up out of the caves there, that, oh, sorry, I can't lay my hand against the Lord's anointed. And everybody knew that he wasn't. David was the one that was anointed. But you don't hear all this, do you? You just don't hear all this. And the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah, which means going round in circles. It means a wheel. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Moan whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. Now, please, please listen to me for a minute. How many women, and I would dare to say millions, are living in miserable marriages? How many women out there, and I appeal to you, and I feel sorry for you. And I've made my apologies for the, my wife who left, um, for good reason. For the sadness that us men have placed upon the women that have committed themselves to our lives. I apologize on behalf of men, and I acknowledge you women that have suffered at the hands of immature and unlife experienced men, please accept my apology. Please accept my appeal for forgiveness. And unfortunately, a lot of these women are just left behind. Their days go by, their lives go by, and the man just goes on with their life, and it just turns out a complete, unemotional, unintimate, Shemozel. Well, this man Nabal had all the money in the world and all the wealth in the world and all the possessions you could want, but he didn't have the character to keep his wife in a good emotional and satisfied way. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. Now, a lot of people don't seem harsh and evil on the surface, do they? And that's where you've got to have discernment. Because it's one thing to meet people outside the house. 
but it's another thing to try and live with somebody, I tell you that. Would you agree with that? Your comments are welcome, please. And he was of the house of Caleb. Now, when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace to you, peace be to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers, your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them. In other words, he's saying, we've protected your shepherds, so now we want, here we go, nor was anything missing from them all the while we were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. That's verification, isn't it? Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we came, we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your sons David. So they're asking him for some supplies, basically, in military language. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal, according to all these words, in the name of David, and waited. Now, how would Nabal know too much about David? He probably heard of his conquests, but David was still a sketchy style of a character. Now David answered, David's, Nabal answered David's servants, excuse me, and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away, each one from his own master. So Nabal was under the, the impression that Saul, uh, David had broken away from Saul. Now this is where Samuel didn't do his job in the community, isn't it? Nabal didn't have a clue that David was the Lord's anointed and neither did anybody else. And this is where Samuel's just died and left this mess behind him. And we're seeing this mess unraveling now. Nabal thinks David's just a breakaway rebel. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men when I don't know where they are from? And that's a fair call, I suppose, isn't it, really? So David's young men turned on their heels and went back, and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. Now, I can't see why David's being aggressive about this. So every man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messages from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt. Nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us both by night and day, all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know, and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master, and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak with him. Okay, pretty pretty fierce, pretty, pretty again, pretty much well a dysfunctional family, and Nabal probably got everything that he had because of his determined attitude. I mean, sometimes you've got to give these people credit. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, 200, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five sears of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, Go on before me, see, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. Interesting, isn't it? So it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went down under cover of the hill, and there were David and his men coming down towards her, and she met them. Now David had sure said, had said, Surely in vain I protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. And he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so, and more also, to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Well, it just goes to show, right, we're talking about David, the great King David. He's going in to um, wipe out a family, a whole family. Now, okay, he protected the sheep shearers and all that in the wilderness, but did they ask him to? Did he require 
any payment. Apparently, Nabel didn't even know who he was, or maybe Nabel was Nabel was just one of these guys that was playing ignorant, took advantage of David's services. I don't know, but it's become ugly, hasn't it? And of course, the woman runs to the rescue. How many women are you running to the re are running to the rescue of your husbands, only to be to cause them to be disabled? Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, O oh me, on me, my Lord, and on me let this iniquity be, and please let your maidservant speak in your ears, and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. Now she's talking about her husband. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal means fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is it with him. But I, your maidservant, do not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Excuse me. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to the bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. He doesn't, she doesn't want them to be fools. Now this present, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. I have to say, asking for forgiveness is a very hard thing, but it's such a good thing. It's relieving for the person that asks for it, and it's a relieving for the person that gives it, isn't it? For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord. And evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. She's talking about Saul. So they knew what was going on. And the Lord and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out. And from the pocket of a sling as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel that this will be no grief to you nor offence of heart to my Lord either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord then remember your maid servant. Now there's a hint, isn't it? There is a hint Abigail must fancy David. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him, and said to her, Go up in peace to your house, See, I have heed, heeded your voice and respected your person. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. And therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him. And he became like a stone. He must have died. Then it happened after about ten days, ten days it took, that the Lord struck Nabal. Now the Lord struck Nabal. Why did they say the Lord struck Nabal? Does anybody know why they say the Lord struck Nabal? Like that's anything that does harm has the capacity to do evil. So that's giving the Lord an evil representation, isn't it? You have to accept that. While the Lord's loving, he also has, the, if he does harm, that's got to be represented as evil. So he has an evil side, according to this, and he died. Nabal died. I don't know if Nabal deserved to die. She took out his stuff so when, to give to David. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his head. Can you relate to that? The Bible doesn't teach that kind of stuff. You don't go around wishing people were dead. 
And David sent and proposed to Abigail. Now, David, <laughs> remember I said there's a possibility that Saul's wife could have been seeing David, possibly in the role of a cougar, as it were. One of Saul's concubines had the same name as Saul's wife, and the scholars aren't sure if it was her or not. And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Straight up, David wants you. Oh, my goodness. And she would have jumped at that because she was in a miserable, miserly, horrible, unaffectionate, by the sound of it, abusive marriage. And could that be you? How are you going to deal with it? How are you going to fix it? I don't know. I really don't know. People just get to a certain age and they ain't going to change. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth and said, Here is your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey. I bet she got out of there real quick, attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives. Now, is Ahinoam, hang on a sec, is Ahinoam of Jezreel Saul's, is that the one that was Saul's wife? I'm going to check this for you. But Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Paltai, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. So Saul had obviously just taken Michal away from David and given, him to an, given her to another man. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing is so out of order. Now give me a sec and I'm going to do some research and we're going to find out who the lady was that was apparently Saul's wife and who Ahinoam of Jezreel is. Just give me one second please listeners. One second. Now this is what I've found. I've just done a quick search. Uh, 1 Samuel 14.50 The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam the daughter of Ahamaz. Now Ahinoam means mother of pleasantries and um, she was the mother of Jonathan, Saul's son Jonathan. Now bear with me please. Now this is how you research. Was Ahinoam, Saul's wife, the same woman that David had as a wife? Ahinoam is a Hebrew name literally meaning brother of pleasantness, thus meaning pleasant. The two references in the Bible to people there are two references in the Bible to people who bear that name. A daughter of Haminahaz who became the wife of Saul and the mother of his four sons and two daughters, one of whom is Michal, David's first wife. A woman from Jezreel who became David's second wife after he fled from Saul, leaving Michal, his first ever wife, behind, who had been given to another man, by the way, by the father and the mother of Amnon, David's first son. That's who she was. Now, some scholars, this is how you research. Some scholars suggest that the two may be, in fact, one person. In Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, 8, God tells David through the prophet Nathan, I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. Now, that is a, that's a heavy statement. Now, I remember this now when I researched this many years ago. This was the part that made me wonder, did Ahinoam, Saul's wife, run off with young David. John Levinson suggests that this implies David took a, a Ahinoam from Saul. Levinson goes on to note that Ahinoam is always mentioned before Abigail. There's a picture of Abigail there. And that she bears David as a son before Abigail does and concludes from this that she was already married to David when the conflict with Nabal erupted. However, when Jonathan, about the same age as, if not older than David, than David, Hunoam, the wife of Saul, would be too old to give birth to David's firstborn son, Amnon. Another objection is that married, the marriage of Ahinoam and David occurred during the civil war between the house of David and the house of Saul. Nevertheless, when David had run away from Saul and dwelt with Achish, king of Gath, he had his two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, with him, 
as per 1 Samuel 27, 3. The term your master's wives would actually imply that David inherited Saul's harems, as was common among ancient kings. Adherents of source criticism suggest that references to a woman called a winnerman being Saul's wife belong to the account of the republication source of the books of Samuel, while in the passages ascribed to the moniarchal source, the only mention of a woman called a Hinnawam is the description of her as a wife of David. See, they're having difficulty accepting that there's a possibility that this could have been Saul's wife. Since Ahinoam's name usually precedes that of Abigail, it has been suggested that David married Ahinoam before he married Abigail. However, if her son Amnon was David's firstborn son, then the order of their names might indicate Ahinoam's status as the crown prince's mother. Now, Inuam is with David during his stay with King Ashkish of Gath and is taken captive when the Amalekites raid Ziklag, David's Philistine base. She is among those who go with David to Hebron when he becomes king over Judah. So we've just done some research. You have to make up your own mind. But I have a slight belief that that woman could have been Saul's ex-wife. You make up your own mind. It doesn't matter either way. I'll see you in the next talk. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one of life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.